Welcome to AJP Audio for June 2022. I'm Aaron Van Dorn. The June issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry is a special issue focusing on mental health disparities and the pervasive negative consequences of structural racism and the importance of community-wide and systemic interventions. So this month on the podcast, AJP Editor-in-Chief Dr. Ned Kalin discusses the issue with guest editor Dr. Crystal Barksdale from the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. I'm Dr. Ned Kalin, and it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce our guest editor, Dr. Crystal Barksdale. Dr. Barksdale is the guest editor of the June issue of AJP, which we're very excited about because this issue is devoted to thinking about how we can advance mental health disparities research based on a workshop that Dr. Barksdale and others coordinated in 2020 to identify new directions in mental health disparities research, a very important area which NIMH is interested in, as well as the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, which co-jointly sponsored this symposium. We decided to work with Dr. Barksdale at the Journal to take advantage of the conference that was put together and to bring to our readership uh, highlights from that conference as part of our mission to further our efforts related to reducing mental health care disparities especially for minoritized populations and populations of color. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Barksdale. Crystal, I was wondering if you could give us a sense of the meeting that took place and also your thoughts about the issue that's, that's upcoming. Yes, great. Thank you, Dr. Kalen, and thank you for having me join you on this podcast and for just the wonderful collaboration for putting this uh, special issue together. It's been really a joy. Well, it's been my pleasure to do it with you as well. (laughs) Thank you. So uh, as you mentioned, I am currently a project director uh, in the Division of Community Health and Population Science at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. We worked in 2020 because of the recognition of leadership really kind of with everything going on and certainly before the start of the pandemic, but leadership recognized kind of the need to address mental health care disparities. And then the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 hit. And then obviously uh, the George Floyd, uh, the issue of George Floyd happened. And I think there was an increasing focus and recognition of the structural issues surrounding disparities um, and certainly mental health care disparities. And so a need to address these persistent mental health care issues that are affecting millions in the country that kind of increased the impetus for this meeting. And so with the collaboration of colleagues at NIMHD, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, we kind of came together to continue developing and working on this meeting entitled our workshop, identifying new directions in mental health disparities research, innovation with a multidimensional lens. And really the purpose of the workshop was twofold. I think it was to gather researchers to highlight and understand innovative approaches to mental health care disparities and research, but also to kind of stimulate the discussion to understand what can be done and how to move the field forward and really address the issue in a, in a meaningful way. Realizing that mental health care disparities are persistent, and that though we've come a long way, that there is still a long way to go, and that mental health care and certainly in issues relating to and impacting minorities and minoritized populations remain elusive, and so that there was an urgent need to address this issue. I was just wondering, Crystal, if you could give us a sense of, in a little more detail, of how the mental health care disparities play out, some of the specifics related to that for populations of color and minoritized populations? Absolutely. I think what we heard from the meeting and certainly what we see and what we know are disparities in access to care still, access to quality treatment, differences. And when we talk about disparities, right, we're talking about differences in utilization across minoritized groups and differences in access and utilization. And that's a significant factor. What we were trying to do and certainly understand is how to how to mitigate and reduce some of those differences. There's also kind of an issue in understanding how to understand and ensure that quality care, not just in terms of access, but then again, once individuals are reaching services and using services, how to make sure that differences are mitigated in terms of outcomes. 
that becomes significant as well. We see differences and disparities, for example, in some mental health outcomes, and that is also problematic. Suicide, for example, uh, comes to mind and certainly is something that we are attendant to and is a, a significant concern. And so it becomes a question of how can research help inform not only strategies to reduce disparities in access, but also in some of the mental health outcomes that are extant and perpetuated. Thank you for that. The other point that I wanted to make and ask you to comment on is the issues related to structural racism yes. um, and institutional racism. And that's a theme that runs throughout the issue and the topics, and also obviously a very prominent factor in all of these disparities that we're talking about. Could yes. you just say a little bit more about how you see structural racism playing such a prominent role? Yes, absolutely. One of the key issues is that for such a long time, I think the field has pointed to and understood disparities through a lens of individual kinds of factors driving disparities and uh, as a primary cause of disparities, a, a primary kind of causal or driver. When you say individual factors, could you be a little more specific for Individual behaviors, uh, right? So thinking about kind of what individuals are doing, their biological factors and kind of individual level factors. So kind of biological factors and individual level behaviors. In IMHD, we have a, a research framework that uh, staff have developed, right? That kind of captures the various levels, dis determinants of health that I think is quite helpful and, and certainly that we promote and advocate. And it's quite helpful. Um, that includes individual level behaviors and factors. But for so long, I think when we think about uh, disparities, there's been such a focus on some of the more individual level behaviors and biological kinds of factors that are the primary drivers. Structural factors, such as structural racism and discrimination, though, are really the primary factors, but have been for really most of our time largely ignored. And so only recently, I think within the past two, well, now we're now 2022, but I think for only the past two years, have we started to really focus on and understand um, more of the field has started to really appreciate the role that structural factors such as uh, structural racism and discrimination are playing and are driving disparities and particularly um, in mental health, but health disparities overall. And so they are a key driver in where we are and in the perpetuation of disparities. And so I think it's so important that we now understand their role and how to measure <laughs> structural racism, how to include and understand their role in and understanding not only kind of their effect on health outcomes, but certainly mental health outcomes and, and how to address it. It's now kind of a centerpiece, if you will, in terms of what we can do to reduce health disparities and mental health disparities. You know, we'll get into some of the specifics of the papers in a couple of minutes, but clearly the papers that are all included in this issue are focused around more systemic structural issues and thinking about doing research as well as interventions that are based and targeted at the, at the structural level. Yeah. I was just wondering, you know, you had mentioned that the structural factors are so prominent and yet have been relatively ignored with the focus on more individual factors. What's your sense of why they've been ignored up until recently? Well, I think because one, it's it's pretty complex. <laughs> I uh -huh. mean, I think I, I think that because of when you start thinking about structural level factors, there is a certain complexity to them, not just historically, uh, right? But uh, again, a complexity in terms of measurement, a complexity in terms of thinking about the outcomes and how how to measure them, and and really how to impact them, how to uh, develop interventions that kind of properly and effectively change those outcomes. Again, when you're talking at an individual level. Level, you're talking about communities, right? You're talking about systems. And so it's, it's thinking, it's moving beyond kind of an individual level and it's thinking about the broader level. That becomes a bit more difficult, but not impossible. And again, I think that that's kind of where we're starting to try to, we're moving, but that's where the field needs to go in terms of really moving the needle. And that's the importance of of really incorporating a social determinants of health perspective. That's the part and parcel of, of not just structural approaches, but really a, a social determinants of health model and, and, and understanding uh, how social determinants play into health and, and understanding and improving health. What we're particularly excited about being able to publish these papers and have a special issue in the American Journal because we have really 
as a group of editors and myself, have committed ourselves to using the journal as best we can to combat structural racism as it relates to mental health and to educate our readership and also to stimulate research and clinical work in this area. Um, yes. So it's, it's really, you know, we're very, very pleased to be able to be working with you and to have this coming out. When I look at the papers that have been included, I know that these are the highlights of the meeting and, and that there were many other presenters as well. We had to be somewhat selective in, in, in what we decided to, to put into the journal. But I was just wondering if you could begin to comment on some of the specifics of some of the papers and some of the highlights that you think are important. Maybe I can start off with just yeah. um, giving you the, the title. Um, so the, one of the first papers that we have in is by Jennifer Alvarez, thinking about uh, mental health disparity research from a multidimensional perspective. And uh, you're a co-author on this paper as well, as you know. <laughs> yes. You know, it really does set the stage for providing a framework for where we need to go. Would you like to say any more about that? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, yes, I, I am a co-author on this paper. And uh, this paper, what we tried to do here was uh, to absolutely provide a framework. And as I mentioned, the NIMHD research framework in particular uh, with this paper, not only tries to provide that framework, but actually tries to advance an adaptation of the NIMHD framework that is specific to mental health. And so I think it, it's really useful because, again, it's, it's something that is, I think, mental health practitioners and researchers can use as they are thinking about, again, innovative ways to advance multi-level work. And again, more of this structural work, not only in their research, but again, in interventions and, and approaching disparities work through this lens. Again, it's not the only framework right. that is out there and available, but again, something that I think can be grounded and used in both research and in, in clinical work. One of the things that I found helpful was, you know, this overview is very explicit about sort of the, some of the steps that should be taken from the standpoint of thinking about research. You know, you talked about them as first, second, and third generation or steps, but the first is understanding how social determinants of health cause, sustain, or mitigate mental health disparities. Mm -hmm. The second is evaluating the interventions that help individuals address the disparities or mitigating their impact. And the third then is what we've been really talking about, I think, is thinking about, you know, interventions that directly impact disparities of health at the broader level to right. enact community change and change at the population level. So I think that's a very helpful uh, roadmap and is quite explicit about steps that would be helpful. Right. Yeah. I think, again, and not only offering the a kind of adapted framework, what we also did was kind of describe some of the, the phases, if you will, of social determinants of health work as it as it relates to mental health disparities research. Right. Yeah. Another paper gets into a little more detail around community mental health and reducing disparities. I wondered if you wanted to comment on her approach. So Dr. Alegria's paper, I think what she attempted to do and, and describe, again, was uh, applying, again, community-based work and specifically offering up, again, a, an approach and, and focusing on kind of a mechanistic approach. And I think that particularly is helpful, especially as we're working on advancing this work, again, because community, community based work and community engaged approaches are uh, especially helpful and especially salient to advancing disparities work. And so what, what she and her colleagues, I, I think, describe as a conceptual overview and an example of the work that they're doing on that's centered in the community for, for reducing disparities and, and working on policy development and partnership with the community. And again, I think it's a, a great example of, of how that can be done with a multi-level approach. And so again, it's, I think, a, a, a wonderful example of, of how this can be done in a very systematic way. It seems like one of the themes that's so critical and also complicated is really having this multi-dimensional approach going all the way from the biology of the individual through societal factors, legal factors, attitudes, and all of that. Yes. As well as obviously funding related to programs that uh, really make a difference for well-being and mental health for children. Yes, absolutely. And again, I think that's the way in which the field is going. And certainly that's something that, you know, I think would be helpful and so certainly something to promote is that pushing the envelope 
past the more individual level perspective, the more individual level focus toward a more multidimensional, multi-level, multi-sectoral approach, right? So really involving multiple levels, multiple sectors, if you will, in the work. Um, and that includes the community. Yes. And, you know, I think as a, as a researcher myself, and having been involved with the NIMH and also grant review panels, I was just thinking that these kinds of approaches are, you know, while they may be embraced by folks at NIMH from the scientific side or uh, from the institute that you're in, I'm not sure that the review committees, you know, are up, up to speed on this. Um, right. And, you know, I think that it's obviously going to be important that the emphasis in, in this type of approach is reinforced from the standpoint of review. Right, right. And I think internally, that's certainly something that, that we're working on and, and that we are constantly always advocating for as well. It's ensuring that uh, review committees and reviewers are kept up to date and, and staying abreast of these issues and, and understanding the importance of, of these issues as well. Yeah, because I think that, you know, the review panels are not used to necessarily looking at all these different levels or this level of complexity. Right. And successful grants in the past have been related to being a little more focused or specific at times in relation to review processes. So I'll look forward to, to learning more about that because I think that's going to be, obviously it's going to be critical to support with real dollars, this type of research to, to advance it. Yes. You know, as looking at the other papers, I guess one of the papers that came to mind was the paper that uh, is first authored by Dr. Sidney Hankerson. And this is about the intergenerational impact of structural racism and cumulative trauma on depression. And I know that he, in this paper, he emphasizes a lot the importance of working with community and community members and stakeholders. And I, I was thinking about that in relation to what you were just talking about. Yes, and I believe, again, his work, and again, I think his work speaks particularly well to the role of community engagement. And I think he, he does a great job of really speaking to how a really nuanced approach of how to do that. Again, and, and especially particularly a, a racially and ethnically diverse community. And, and again, on a topic and on a particular issue um, uh, with regards to depression. And, and again, doing so uh, takes time. And I think that's the, that's the point that this is not uh, something that is done quickly, that again, true community community engagement and, and community-based work does take time. And I think as, as he uh, probably describes in his paper, and again, in, ter in terms of uh, exploring the impact of structural racism and trauma in his paper, I think, but doing so in a community-based and in a community-engaged way, excuse me, um, it, it takes time. And I think that will make the most impact. And certainly with regards to addressing an outcome such as depression, which again has been shown, especially recently and within the context of the last two years is something that is increasing and is, is affecting uh, minoritized populations uh, at increasing rates. I had the uh, opportunity to meet in person with Dr. Hankerson a couple of weeks ago. And in addition to being so impressed with his work, I came away with a, such an appreciation for the amount of commitment and energy that he's put into his work. And, and as you're pointing out, how much time it's taken him to, to work with the community, to build a sense of trust and a coalition, mm -hmm. and to um, really develop research strategies that are based on the needs of the community, right. uh, and not necessarily always just simply coming from the, the scientific question or the researcher per se. Right, absolutely. And, uh, and again, I think that's, that's the strength of, of his work. And, and anybody that is doing this uh, and doing this work is, again, appreciating the bi-directionality, right? The, the collaboration, the collaboration, the collaborative nature, and the time that it takes to build that collaboration. But it's bi-directional. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a unidirectional hierarchical kind of process. He also talked about receiving some of support from his own institution. Um, for getting things going in these directions and then, you know, resulting in, a, in an NIH grant. Yes. Um, but I'm wondering if, if another research funding strategy isn't to think about early dollars to actually support the development of these types of working coalitions with community and researchers. It absolutely is. And I think that's, that's certainly a point well taken and something that I, I, I think we thought about. And I, I think there's, there's certainly some evidence of that. And certainly... I know for a fact with NIMHD, something that, that we're considering and, and dollars 
that are put in with regards to supporting kind of the development of uh, community coalitions and, and the like, and then again, approaches to uh, following up with that work and developing that work. Great. That's, that's really, that's helpful to hear. Mm -hmm. um, another paper by uh, Chiara Alvarez yes. um, also is related to this area uh, where this group of authors consider structural racism and suicide prevention for minoritized youth. Yes. Um, um, what are your thoughts about, uh, about this work? Yeah. So again, another, uh, again, all of the por uh, papers are, are again, <laughs> critically important and, and, and really exciting. This is another one too, uh, timely because of suicide and, and the topic and youth suicide. And again, uh, how much of a, a increasing problem it's becoming among uh, minoritized youth and what we're starting to learn and understand about the, the role that structural racism and discrimination is playing in this outcome. And so I think, again, what her paper is providing is, again, this, this understanding of the role that structural racism and its impact among Hispanic youth, a population that we haven't heard much about, but are learning about, um, and I think we'll need to learn even more about, certainly. But also, again, not just the developmental perspective, but again, also the cultural context. And so I, I think it, again, provides a, a unique uh, opportunity to, again, delve into two very important aspects uh, with regards to youth suicide. Again, I can't say enough. I, I, I work in this space and, and again, both clinically and, and from a research perspective. And so from the, the perspective of Black youth suicide. And so again, I think it's something that we just need to know more about in terms of the, the role that structural racism and discrimination play. So really a really important piece here. The overviews that you provided have been very helpful. We're extremely excited about this issue coming out in June. And as I mentioned earlier, the editors and myself as editor-in-chief are highly committed to using the journal to best move the field in the right direction from the standpoint of really trying to tackle the structural racism and racism at other levels in relation to mental health care. I was wondering if you had any further thoughts about how the journal, how the American Journal can be helpful in this regard and ideas about where we might go in the future. What you've done in terms of, of continuing to, of collaborating with me, with, with NIMH and with NIMHD, with funding institutions, doing this effort is a, a wonderful start. I think continuing to do, I've, I've seen the work that you've done with other papers, other authors. I think continuing to do this and continuing to lend a voice, continuing to diversify and lend a, a voice to um, your editorial board, you know, diversifying your editorial board so that there is a, a diversification of voices on the board and, and the like, but just continuing to have a voice um, and, and provide a space where these issues can be uh, discussed is critical and, and it's appreciated, uh, certainly from my perspective. Because without these discussions, without this forum, it will not be discussed, and I think it will die. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that even two years later, we've been able to do this and to have this space. Because um, I think there is a concern that you know some of the momentum from the past two years, from two years ago, certainly might die. But I think continuing to have these discussions and see your investment and your interest is important. So I would say continuing to, to create the space um, for the voices and for the conversation is, is critical. Well, well, thank you for that. I, we definitely will, will continue. And as I said, I'm extremely committed to this. My hope is that we can transform the journal in a way that these issues are part of the everyday business of the journal and are instantiated into our aims and our goals in a way that, that goes on uh, in perpetuity and does not peter out or run out of gas. Excellent. Great. <laughs> That's exciting for me to hear. <laughs> good, good. Is there anything else that you'd like to say, uh, Crystal, um, while, while we still have a few minutes together? I just, I again, I want to thank you and thank Michael for, again, your just openness to participate and work with, with me, work with us on this. I think my co-chairs from the meeting um, and all the program staff and uh, who worked on this effort and I, and I think all of the um, actually participants of the meeting, again, and certainly those that um, participated in this effort, uh, this all could not have happened without everybody working together and making this, making all of this come to fruition. So my heartfelt thanks and appreciation to everybody that was involved. 
Thank you, Crystal, for that. And, and I, too, again, want to thank you for your uh, your effort with this and, and the initiative and the energy that you've put into it and your leadership in this area. Thank you. It's been really great having you do the special issue as the editor of that and working with you. And I actually look forward to, to working with you as we move forward in the future with, with our mutual goals. Thank you. I do as well. That's all for this month on the podcast, but why not check out some of the APA's other podcasts? This month on Psychiatric Services, from Pages to Practice, Dr. Dixon and Dr. Bearson talked to Dr. Courtney Von Hippel about the impact of lived experiences on burnout and negative job attitudes in mental health workers. You can check out that and the APA's other podcasts at psychiatryonline.org slash podcasts. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual speakers only and do not necessarily represent those of the American Psychiatric Association. The content of this podcast is provided for general information purposes only and does not offer medical or any other type of professional advice. If you're having a medical emergency, please contact your local emergency response number.